inside of your heart that says, God, draw me closer to the well of your goodness and grace. And God, give me a knowledge of your word. I want to understand more than I've ever been understood before and just do the perfect will of God. And uh, tonight, Sister Tracy's going to come. She's good. She has become my official reader. Come on up here. This way they do it in, uh, what'd you call it, Brother uh, Eric? He says, uh, the black church, the, yes, that's the way that a lot of the black churches do it. And uh, so they have readers. I was teasing her the first time I had to read something. There's a lot of reading. I told her, I said, you're going to become my official reader. I was only kidding. And uh, she still hasn't assumed that title. But anyway, nonetheless, um, I gave her some, some stuff here to read. That way you don't have to listen to me as much. But I want to get your Bibles out tonight to Second Thessalonians tonight, chapter 2 and verse number 1. We're going to read through. We've got about 17 verses tonight. And uh, most likely when we only have a couple verses, then uh, I won't have Sister Tracy read. But this is quite a bit of reading, and I'm sure she can handle it. Uh, before you know it, she might be an in-house preacher before you know it. So stand your feet, get ready to read the Word of God with us tonight. I want you, as we read, to pay close attention to what you're reading. I want you to think about what's being said here as she gets ready to read tonight. Go ahead whenever you're ready, Sister Tracy. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the, our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye may not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. That's right. Come on. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above that is called God, and that is worship, so that he is God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in this time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who... Now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall thou wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and thou shalt destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs of lying wonders, and with all de deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believeth not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And we are bound to give thanks always to God for you brethren beloved of the Lord. Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by the word or <clears throat> our epistle. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work, word and work. Amen. We're going to tonight, with the Lord's help, preach to you for just a little while, kind of preach, teach, possibly, just depending on how the Lord wants me to, to go about this. But we're going to talk to you tonight for a little while on Pentecostal Distinctives. Would you hit, raise your hand to the Lord tonight and ask God to just have his way. Father, tonight we love you. We appreciate the word of God. We're asking you tonight, God, to use it to speak directly to us. We need to hear the voice of God tonight. We're asking you, Lord, to let us leave this place better than when we came. God challenged deeper, closer than we've ever been. And I believe that you're, you're going to do that tonight through your grace and your anointing tonight in Jesus' name. 
And everyone can say amen. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord tonight. Talking tonight for a little while, and if you just give me all your undivided attention for as long as you can, I'd like to talk to you tonight about a subject that you may not hear a lot about, but it is a very needful thing. Now, some may look at it and say, well, is it really that necessary? Preach us out of a ditch tonight or, you know, something like that. But this is the direction that the Spirit of God led me into, and I know that I'm on track right here. We're facing a lot of things in the church world today, and a lot of people are going in different directions. The churches seem to be taking on their own agendas in many ways. But I want to talk to us about the Pentecostal distinctives. If we were to look at the picture a little bit larger than that, it should technically be the Christian distinctives tonight. But as we set apart a denomination or a group of people that have a fundamental group of, of views or standing in God. I want us to zero in on that tonight because here's the difference. If I did not believe that what I believe was right, I would get out of it and I'd get in something else. I'd believe something different. But after all these years, I am convinced of what I've read in the Word of God and that is why I stand true to what I feel like God has shown me through the Word of God. Now, I want us to take a few moments tonight. I want us to look at our text. I want you to look back. There was a lot of reading here, but I'm going to simplify what we have read tonight. If we were to look back tonight, what, the question that really kind of resounded in my mind, and I was kind of playing back and forth. If I was sitting in the pew, you know, what would I want to know? If I was in your shoes tonight and I wasn't the one doing the preaching, I thought to myself, what would they want to know? What would, what would God's people want to know? Well, what is exactly is the basis of our text? And especially of all these different verses that we've read tonight, especially verse number 15. Now let me read verse 15 again tonight. I want you to listen to it. The Bible said, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or epistle. So basically, everything that I believe God is going to build upon from this passage, all of these scriptures, we're going to use verse 15 as a primary portion to hinge off of tonight to preach what God's laid on my heart. Now, I want to talk to you about verse number 15 for just a little bit here. While a lot of people, many people in the time I've been serving God and from uh, way back even before I got saved, a lot of people have used verse number 15 to be able to persuade men and women to focus on material items and legalistic ordinances and such as that. And, and that's not at all what the intended purpose behind what the Word of God God says here. You see, we could go to the extent, and I'm just going to be plain if that's all right tonight, but I, I could be plain tonight and I could come to you and I could say, uh, now Sister Tracy, you know the Bible backs it up that you shouldn't even use chapstick because it's a little too much like lipstick or you can't have white wall tires on your car because that's prideful. You can't have white walls on your, on your car. You cannot wear any color. If you wear anything, you're going to have to wear black breeches and a white shirt and you can't and if you wear a tie it's got to be black some folks may say no tie at all I could come to you and I could kind of give you some different ideas about what I thought or what somebody else thought and then I could turn around this is why I want to tell you tonight this verse has been used to pervert the gospel and to distract men from what's the truth but I've seen people that use this verse to back up what they are saying well you know you you, you know you can't use chapstick too much like lipstick because the Bible said that you're to hold the traditions which were taught by your father. It don't matter what your parents, if your parents taught you the wrong thing. According to them, you got to do whatever your parents did, whatever the last generation did. It don't matter what makes sense or what's logical. But this verse has been, now I'm going to get myself in trouble. There's folks probably listening on the internet that turned me off already. That's all right. Goodbye. I love you. Hallelujah. God bless you. But I want to tell you tonight, the fact is that this verse has been used to pervert the minds of people to convince folks that what God really was trying to say is that anything that I think is right, that has now become a tradition.
And you got to do whatever I said. But if that's not the case, then Brother Myers, I know you want to know, then what was the original intended purpose behind? Verse number 15. I'm going to read it again to you first before I tell you. The Bible said, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, the purpose behind what was written here, it was not to persuade men to focus on materialistic legal things and what is it? The purpose is clearly seen in verse number 13. So we're going to have to look back at verse number 13 and see what it says so you understand. The Bible said in verse 13, we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. What does he say? Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to what? Salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So everything that was written in verse number 15, it hinges on the fact. And the answer of the reason for verse number 15 is found in verse number 13. What was it, Brother Myers? Well, first of all, he said salvation. For the Bible said, Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through, secondly, sanctification, and third, belief of the truth. And so we've got a man of God. We've got a writer who is writing to the church and he is under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And he says I want you to hold to the traditions that were taught to your forefathers and I want you to hold fast to these things. What was the basis of the things that were taught? It was taught to them about the salvation that brought them to Jesus Christ in the very beginning. The sanctification. That purification fine process of God through the spirit and thirdly he said the belief of the truth. You see the man of God knew there was this great potential to cause you to fall away and to go astray from the truth of what you knew from the very beginning. I don't have time and space would fail me tonight to tell you how that over thousands of years since the time that Jesus walked the sandy seashores of Galilee in flip flops in a robe since the time of Jesus here on earth there has been countless hundreds and thousands of new doctrines new forms, new opinions, new ideas that have been added to the ideas of the word of God and you see the man of God when he wrote this knew there was a great potential that if people were not mindful of the devices of the devil that they would become uh, distracted by this and they would pervert the gospel and so the man of God said hold fast uh, that that you have been taught in other words to hold tight to it cling to it why would you need to cling to it because you know and I thought about this on the way to church tonight suppose you were the devil and some folks act like they are or they're married to him what but suppose you were the devil tonight if you were going to undermine God's church if you were going to cause confusion to plague God's church if you were going to cause a dissension within God's church what would be the things that you would do as I began to think about that I thought to myself one of the first things uh, that I can see the devil doing uh, is trying to muddy the waters uh, of what is truth uh, trying to get folks away from the original blueprint and plan of God and you know several years ago I heard an evangelist friend of mine who said something that has stuck with me over the years uh, and I'm going to try to explain to you what I'm saying tonight and why this is so important. Now if you are not a contractor, never worked with a tape measure, then this might not make a lot of sense. But for those of us that's ever worked with a tape measure it'll make a lot of sense, especially if you know how to read one. But if you've ever looked at a tape measure I didn't really know that I learned this in high school, passed, you know I graduated but the day that I put a tape measuring my head. I had to learn how to measure all over again. I done forgot what I'd learned. But when you look at a 
tape measure. Those little teeny tiny lines that are on that tape measure, they represent sixteenths of an inch. That's very small amounts on the tape measure. Now there's some of you tonight that if I said measure out sixteen foot six and a half inches, you'd be able to do it. But if I said measure out uh, sixteen foot six and fifteen sixteenths, you wouldn't understand because those little sixteenths of an inch they matter. Now here's what I want to show you tonight. If you'll follow me, I don't have a tape tonight to show you what I'm talking about, but I'm going to demonstrate it from just a, you know you just have to imagine tonight. You put on your thinking cap and pretend. But if I was to measure out tonight six foot and I stop and I say okay now from there I want you to stick the tape measure and measure another six foot and we stop and I say now measure another six foot now add another 15 foot to that what you don't understand is that there is a very probability it's very probable that with each new measurement that you add all it takes is to lose a 16th down there a 16th here and a 16th and before you know it you are actually added a quarter of an inch to your measurement. And so I want you to follow what I'm saying because this is good. So in other words, Brother Billy, you know what I'm talking about because you've worked in that fashion before. We've had times before where that you took five measurements uh, and from the process of taking four or five and you start where you left and you measure, start where you left and you measure. Then you get over here and you're a half an inch too long or maybe you lost a little bit in the process. Now here's what we look at when we look at the church historically many years ago they had scribes and Pharisees the scribes were those that kept record of everything that was written as far as the word of God was concerned they made sure that when they sat down with their little pen and their paper they jotted down what the word of God said they kept kept an accurate record they were constantly duplicating uh, the word of God to make sure there was always a copy of the word of God I want you to follow what I'm saying. This is powerful stuff. So for many years the scribes would sit down at a table. You've heard scribes and Pharisees always wondered what a scribe was. Well I'm schooling you tonight telling you what he did. This is one of the jobs of a scribe to sit down and to take what was written in the Bible and copy it so there would always be an accurate copy of the word of God. So it was important that every I was dotted so to speak. Every T was crossed so to speak. Every single little thing that the word of God said, it was important for it to be exact and precise when they when they transferred it to the new document. Now here's where the measuring tape comes into play. What I have seen in our churches over the years is that over the many, many years of courses, amen, we picked up, we've started, we've left off. We've added a new movement, a new denomination, a new set of beliefs. And for from the time that Jesus hung up on the cross and until 2016 there are so many mushroom churches they call it so many thousands of variations of doctrines and ideas about what the truth is that the devil has done and I hate to say this a pretty fair job of muddy in the waters of what's true and what's not true can you say hey, oh God help us here tonight I heard one time that somebody said that now there this was a about maybe 15, 10, 15 years ago that there was actually a Mormon denomination that was called a Mormon Pentecost. In other words, they were part Mormon and part Pen. I don't even know. Don't I can't explain it, but that's what they call this Mormon Pentecost. Then I heard of another group and this group just totally blew my mind. It was called the Free Love Pentecostal Movement. And their Free Love Pentecostal Movement Movement. You can just use your imagination here, adults. In other words, when you joined the church, it was free love. If you were married and you were part of the church, in other words, that couple could be with that couple because now they are a part of the same body. Amen. So it's free love. It's a free for all. Free love Pentecostal. Now, how 
in the world do you get that? It's because you start, you stop, you start, you stop, you add to, you pick up, and all of this. But I like what that evangelist was got to preach. As it got inside of me many, many years ago, he said what we need to do is stop somewhere and go wait. Things are way out of proportion, and it ain't nothing like it was when Jesus walked the shores of Galilee and preached the word of God. Sometimes you gotta hook the tab of that tape measure where you originally started and you gotta pull a line all the way back to where you're measured. Amen, you might say, I don't want a piece here and a piece there and a part there. I don't want your 1945 idea of what God was. I don't want your 1800s idea of who God is or the King James idea. Listen, I'm King James version all the way. But let me tell you, some folks have added their piece, their part, their whatever until they have perverted the word of God. And I want to tell you here tonight, what I say is God, take the church all the way back to Calvary and let's pull a measuring line from Calvary all the way to 2016 so we can get it right. Somebody say amen. I got some preaching here to do tonight. You say, help that preacher. Amen. But he talked about salvation, sanctification, and the belief of the truth. That was what you and I were to hold to. We're to hold fast to those fundamental distinctives that separated the Christian church from just any other church. And I want to ask us a question tonight. Why is it important? And why were we told to hold fast? The answer is because it's easy if you're not careful over the process of time for the enemy to come in and persuade you here, persuade you there, and you fall from your steadfast place. Say amen somebody. Well, I used to believe. I used to this and that and the other. Are you sure? What verse 3 say? He said, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall come, except there come a fallen away first. But that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. You know what he was saying? Before that day can come, there will come a falling away. What is that falling away a result of? Because at one time, they held on to the biblical truth. At one time, they were holy. They were rock solid. They were saints. They were committed. But somewhere along the way, they let go and there was a falling away from the truth. Amen. That's why in verse number 15, he said, hold fast. Hold on to what you've been taught. Somebody say, God help the church tonight. Who is it behind that great falling away? The same one that is still actively tonight working even now to water down the church bit by bit and dismantle the true church even right now. Let me tell you, I'm not just beating and framing, beating and banging around tonight for my health. I'm telling you something that is very serious and it's more serious than you understand. Just a few years ago, within the church of God, Lord help me, I was told I, don't, I wasn't part of that, that uh, biannual meeting and what have you and voting, but I was told by several pastors that there's a group of young people that are coming up within the ranks of the Pentecostal church of today, within the church of God, who are taking a whole different perspective on Pentecostalism. And they say that they proposed in that great biannual meeting of the church of God, they proposed that they change the bylaws of the church of God where it said that the evidence of the, the Holy Ghost baptism was evidence of speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. They were trying to get it turned and changed that it no longer read that it was by the evidence of speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Now that 
tells me that we're in a lot of trouble within the church ranks today. That when you've got, I'm not talking about whether somebody believes it's right or wrong to wear lipstick or earrings or pants or whatever. I'm talking about Bible, doctrinal truths of the word of God. I'm talking about stuff that the church should stand on and we shouldn't be swayed. It's either the word or it ain't the word. Who in their right mind could call themselves Pentecostal? Come along in a new generation and say, well, we need to make this thing more welcoming to other people and other denominations and whatnot. So we just blur the lines of distinctives about what makes the Pentecostal church what it is today. How many of you that are here tonight even if you're not baptized with the Holy Ghost, have read enough of the Bible that there's enough in there that you believe that the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost was as they spoke in tongues, as the Spirit gave the utterance. I believe tonight that the greatest evidence of all will always be power because the devil can mimic a lot of things. But I still believe that the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. Now you might say tonight, why do you believe that? Well, I'll just give you a few little things right here. You know what the Bible said about the tongue? It said it's a deadly member full of deadly poison. And the Bible said, just like that little bitty tailpiece on the end of a great ship, that little bitty tailpiece can change the direction of the entire ship. And the Bible said, that is like your tongue. It's like a little member full of deadly poison. And guess what? No man can tame it. Oh, we're going to preach here tonight. Hair lip the devil. Huh? No man can tame it. You hear that? I want to drive it home tonight. I said, no man. You say that tonight. No man can tame it. But, so why is it significant that on the days of Pentecost, that whenever the Spirit of God came down, that they began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance? And why was it significant when the man of God, Paul, got down and prayed and prayed in tongues? I can tell you this, and this is what I believe with all of my heart. You see, the worst, most deadly, unruly member of your body is your tongue. The moment, the moment that the baptism of the Holy Ghost interacts with what's inside of you and you get filled and your tongue breaks loose and goes to speaking in the tongues of angels, is the moment that I know that the tongue that no man can tame, the Holy Ghost just did. You say, I can't help myself get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Well, I like to cuss folks out when I get mad. You need to pray God sanctify me and fill me with the Holy Ghost because that little unruly member that you can't tame, the good Holy Ghost can. And when you begin to speak with tongues as with angels, if it ain't a sign that the Holy Ghost has taken over, then I don't know what is. It's the Holy Ghost saying, I got the last unruly member. I got the tongue. Say amen, somebody. You see, this ain't popular preaching when you preach a doctrine awaited subject. But folks, I'm sick and tired of seeing the church it being eroded away of what the church stands for and what the church is today. Say amen, somebody. But it is because of what I'm telling you tonight that I firmly believe that we, the church, must be aware of what Satan would like to do and what he intends to do to the church by eroding everything that has made us the church. I want you to listen very closely for just a minute. If the devil can water down 
the potion. Think about the end result. If the devil can get the church, the Pentecostal church that believed in prayer by faith to start thinking in their mind, this, this is one for the doctors. This is one for Advil. This is one for Tylenol. This is one for Oxycodone. Huh? Now listen. I thank God for every medicine advance that God has given us. But we in the church don't understand what we have allowed ourselves to believe within the church. And so, I used this example here a few years back and I'm going to use it again tonight with the Lord's help. And I say this by the glory of God and to no disregard or respect to anybody at all. Especially these folks because they're, they're the cream of the crop. I love their heart like my own family. But Brother Smith, when they first came to Grace Street Church of God and the first time that I saw their family and the first time I saw Rebecca flip her hair over and I saw them little hearing aids in her ears uh, the very first thing that crossed my mind was I'm going to pray for her. I'm going to believe God. We're going to, while she's here, while they're attending this church, we're going to see God heal those ears. It bothered me. I'm going to tell you something, Brother Benefield. It got next to me how many times that I looked and I thought to myself, we're going to pray. But let me tell you what we did uh, as a church. The same thing that other folks in other places did. Well, at the first, you get real hyped up and excited. Well, we're going to believe God. God's going to heal. Well, you do that for a few weeks, a few months go by, and you don't see no results, and things begin to taper off. Things begin to die down, and you may never say it with your lips, but the times that you walk right by and you don't pray like you used to, it's almost as if you started saying, this is one for the doctors. Let me tell you, church, if we're the real church, we got to start getting back to believe uh, that by prayer that God still changes stuff. Our lack of faith has got to be a stench in the nostrils of God. Huh? I was thinking about it the last few days. Let me tell you that when I'm not talking about a generation looking for signs, and I'm not talking about this blow you over, sprinkled gold dust, pick you back up, and make a big show on television stuff either. But I'm going to tell you, that stuff is a mockery for the real thing. How do you know? I've seen God do the miraculous. I've seen God heal people in prayer lines. I was in one service one night where we got to praying around in a prayer line. Somebody came up with skin cancer on their arm, been there for years, got to praying and watched it fall off their arm right there in the prayer line. You see, when you get away from the distinctives of what and who we've always been, we're nothing more than just another ordinary watered down church. It's time that if we're going to be the church, man, we got to start believing like we're the church. We got to come on, we got to start operating like the church. Well, it was good. The man of God shadow, it was cast on people and they got healed. That was good. That was back then. Now you're starting to sound like God. Please don't take this wrong, nobody. Now you're starting to sound like some Baptist folks I know. Now, Brother Myers, take it easy on them Baptist folks. I am, because there's some of them more saved and got more victory than some Pentecostal people do. But I'm going to tell you something. The Baptist folks or anybody other kind of folks that don't believe in the gifts and the signs and the healings, they're wrong. I don't care what title they put on it. That's wrong. I read one by Calvinistic doctrine. If you don't understand, one saved always say it was birth in Calvinism. And if you're not, if you don't believe in one say, you just learn something new. You're, you favor the Arminianism side. For those of you that didn't know, but Calvinism and that old one saved always saved garbage. I picked up a Bible. It was a Calvinistic, a base doctrinal a Bible commentary, and I got to reading about the gifts of the Spirit, and it blew me away. I want, boy, I'm 
telling you, I ain't never chunked the Bible like that. I wanted to. I thought to myself, somebody, this ain't even fitting to read. Amen. Need to cross out the commentary, keep the rest of the word. But it said about the gifts and the signs and the miracles, it said all that was that took place on the days of Pentecost was like the scaffolding that you erect around the building when you're working on it and painting and remodeling it. And what do you do when it's all done? You take it all down. You know what they were saying? I don't have time to preach the whole thing out because I didn't come here to preach about somebody else's doctrine. I've just come to preach to you about the truth and about the faults. And basically what they were saying is, and this if you study the doctrine, I don't have to convince you. You'll see it for yourself. Everything that God was going to do, the miracles, the signs, the gifts, the tongues, the prophecy, all of that, was nothing more than something God used in the book of Acts to launch the church. And once the church was launched, the scaffolding came down. In other words, you will see no healings now. You'll hear nobody speak in tongues now as the Spirit gives you. You'll hear no prophecy now. And you know what they try to use to back that garbage up? It said something in the Word of God about until the perfect one comes. In other words, what they're trying to say is that all this stuff is not going to be until that when we get to heaven and whatnot. We're not going to have no gifts, no signs, no nothing. What they failed to understand is the perfect one had already came. You see, we're not going to need prophecy in heaven. We're not going to need tongues and interpretation in heaven. But we still need the gifts of the Spirit in operation today. Why in the world would Paul say, I would that y'all speak with tongues. I would that y'all seek for the gift of prophecy. Why would he iterate the nine gifts of the Spirit if it was nothing more than a book of Acts thing? I'm telling you, we got to get back to standing on what we believe and stand fast on it. It's either right or it ain't. I've shared this before and I'm going to share it again tonight with you. But when I got saved, Brother Billy, I thought to myself, now look, my grandma's background's Pentecostal. They went to church in Mount Dora years ago, Church of God. I got some family on the Matthew side. They was in the Church of God and they was Pentecostal. And, but I don't want to be Pentecostal just because I got some family that was. I mean, if this thing ain't right, then I don't want to be in it. If I gave my life to God and I'm going to run this race, I don't want to get caught up in something that ain't right. And you can ask my wife, if you don't believe what I'm telling you, I think you will. But I used to sit for hours and hours after I got saved, reading the book of Acts and reading First and Second Corinthians and reading about the Acts of the Apostles and all the miracles and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. My wife said, what are you doing? I said, I'm just making sure that what I believe is right. And you know what, folks? I didn't even understand the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I remember the night I was at church and uh, I forget her name now, Sister Hudson, uh, was in the back of the church. She'd come up and pray for my God. I'm telling you, those older saints, they didn't let an altar service pass. Uh, they got up, they went down to the altar and prayed for folks. Uh, Sister Amanda Cannon, uh, Sister uh, Karen Cannon's mama, Sister Cannon, she would come, uh, not Sister Cannon, but Sister, uh, what was Brother, hey man, what was it? Brother Clarity, his wife, she'd take her little walker, she'd walk all the way from the side back of the church and walk all the way up to the front with muscular dystrophy and she'd sit on a pew and reach out her hand and pray for folks. Uh, guess who was standing or sitting right by me the night I got baptized? It was Sister Clarity. Come on, somebody. What's our excuse? Huh? God, take us back to a divine move of Pentecost. Give us a duplication of the demonstration of spirit and power of Pentecost. You can have your dead church. Take it if you want it. To. Come on. We're not trying to compete with Hollywood. We're trying to pluck souls out of hell and populate heaven, somebody. <laughs> Sister Hudson reached out. I've probably heard this before, but it's all right, I'm sure. Sister Hudson reached her hand out. She is praying for me. Man, I was standing up. Next thing you know, I was on the floor. I have no idea how I ended up on the floor. And I was pretty skeptical. 
I mean to tell you, I wasn't just going to be like some of these folks. They go pushing on you. I'll be looking at somebody with an eye open like, I don't know what you're pushing on me for. The Spirit don't do it. I don't want it. That's just the way I was. Matter of fact, I've done told you all this, but we was in one service where one pastor's wife, when one church we went to, I was sitting in there, and they got to hooping and hollering, running around, and uh, I looked over at my wife. I said, I'm going to the house. She said, why? I said, I ain't getting a thing out of this. These people running around here speaking in, in Indian or something, and I ain't getting a thing out of this. I'm going to the house. That's what I told her. And then, well, you know what happened to me? I didn't know. I had no, I didn't know, folks. I was just about as green as they come. I didn't have no clue. But I'll tell you what happened. Whenever I got to get, really got saved and I started praying, Brother Billy, I was down praying one night. I didn't even really understand what the baptism of the Holy Ghost was. I didn't. But I was praying. I knew there was more because they told me there was more. Pray, there's more. Man, I got to praying. I, I wound up on the floor. I was rolling and shaking and jerking. I felt like I never felt before. Woo, Lord of mercy. When the service was over with, y'all done heard this story. You already know the punchline at the end of this. But whenever it was over with, I felt like I was on cloud nine. I was walking out of church. Sister Hudson standing in the foyer. She wasn't a little, but a little thing. She reached out her hand. She said, Brother Joe. She said, I was so good to see you praying tonight. She said, you almost got it. I said, what? I almost got it? What you talking about? I just got some over there. You know, I'm thinking if I didn't get it tonight, what is it going to take to get it? I mean, I was kind of, at first I was frustrated. I went home and I told my wife, I said, who is that lady telling me I almost got something? What is that all about? But you know what? She was right. And that's where a lot of folks, they mess up. They get a little jerk, a little shake. and Oh, oh, oh Lord mercy, I got it. But you know what happened? I kept on praying. And one night, I'll never forget the night that God baptized me in the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, I didn't know what in the world I was even doing. Next thing you know, my lips started jerking. I started feeling that quiver in my chest. And I don't know how to explain it, but it's like a feeling that comes up across the back of your head. Kind of comes up and feels like something coming up here. All of a sudden, man, the power of the Holy Ghost hit me. I began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. And I began to think to myself, that's what my grandma was doing when we were sitting in the living room. And I wonder what she was doing. Hey, man, I thought that's talking in Indian. I didn't know what it was. Was, but the night that I got baptized, uh, I wanted to speak in it too because it felt good. I didn't care what nobody thought. It, it was different. I know it was. And folks look at you like you're crazy. That's all right. One of these days, I'm going to be crazy for my Jesus worship uh, shouting all over glory. Some of all you're crazy. You're radical and all that kind of stuff. Well, if you ain't never read the book of Acts, you don't know radical. You don't know crazy. You explain to me. Oh, they, they're crazy. They worship crazy. Explain to me about people looking at folks worshiping and saying they're drunk. How do drunk folks act? Drunk folks act crazy. I can't even imagine what was they doing. Slurred speech, staggering around. Laughing? I don't know what that's doing. I guarantee you it wasn't like this modern day garbage where they're clucking like chickens and barking like dogs, sprinkling fake gold dust and saying that's a move of God. Come on, somebody. I can tell you this. I believe with all of my heart it was a demonstration of the Holy Ghost that came down on the day of Pentecost. And they began to watch and they said, man, these folks are crazy. They're stumbling around. They act like they're drunk. Somebody said, they ain't drunk as you suppose. See, anybody, it's but the ninth hour of the day. They're not drunk. But I can tell you this, folks. There's a lot of people that may look at us and think that we're crazy. But I can tell you what the devil has tried to do. 
He has tried to erode and water down what was once powerfully attractive to the wayward soul. He has tried his best to take that that was once holy and pure to all the dirty hearts and minds of this world and make it something else. We've got today within the church where that our Jesus, they paint Jesus. And, uh, and if you go back and study, it's the fakest, falsest stuff. It makes me sick to my guts. They got a sissified looking Jesus with real long hair down his back. That wasn't even in the Bible. He wasn't even a, Naz- he wasn't a Nazarene or a uh, a Nazarite like that. He was a Nazarene. Oh, but Leonardo, I don't forget his name. I know he wasn't one of the Ninja Turtles. Huh? But he painted a picture of Jesus many, many years ago and put long hair on him. And now everybody thinks he's got long hair. Well, wait a minute. On some high. Listen, you get ruffle your feathers if you want to. The Bible is the Bible, and the Bible still says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Well, I don't like. I got a better version than that. You what? Whatever. The Bible says it is a shame for a man to have long hair. It would be contradictory for the man of God who knew that Jesus walked the earth for him to write such as that when the man of God put pen and paper to ink and say that does not nature itself teach you that it is a shame for a man to have long hair, right? It would have been contradictory if the Lord himself would have walked around looking like that. You say, well, what about Samson and all these other? Listen, I'm not going to split hair about hair but I will tell you this that was a Nazarite vow of shamefacedness they took before God and so we are in a day when we've got a thug Jesus a rock and roll Jesus a redneck snuff dipping Jesus and every other kind of Jesus because that appeals to folks. Listen, we have done a disservice to this generation by selling them a hip hop. Uh, come on, Jesus. A thug, britches wearing Jesus with the britches hanging down. Oh, I saw a bumper sticker one time said, Jesus is my homeboy. You know how, uh, you know how that sounds? There's no reverence for God. He just like somebody with an LA Lakers hat on, tilted to the side with some gold teeth. Jesus is my homeboy. Huh? Sounds so disrespectful. But you see what this generation has done? Just like that tape measure. You say, now, Brother Myers, that's all foolish. Hey, man, what I'm telling you is that we have tarnished the image of purity of Jesus Christ. We have tarnished the image of the church. We have tarnished the image of ministry with fake, false stuff. You want to know the reason why? Years ago, I remember somebody asked me, said, what denomination are you? I was on a job one day. Somebody said, what What denomination are you? I almost didn't want to tell them. Why? Because of all this crazy stuff you see on TV, fake and phony stuff, begging widows for all their little bit of life savings. They can fly around in jet airplanes, wear $20,000 dinner rings on every finger. Push people in the floor, pick them up, push them down, pick them up, push them down, pick them up, sell them holy water, all kind of different crazy stuff. Send them wallets and tell them it's a magical wallet. All they got to do is put money in it, send it back to the folks that gave it to them. I had one preacher friend of mine that told me, he said, they sent me a wallet. I sent it back to them and said, if it works, put your own money in it. Praise God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> There's so much of that. What it has done is tarnished the image of the church. Somebody said, what denomination are you? I didn't want to say nothing. Because then when you tell somebody you're Pentecostal, they associate you with everybody of fake, false, phony stuff they've seen before. But you know what? I finally got out of that. And I finally, somebody asked me, said, what are you? I said, I'm Pentecostal. I ain't ashamed of it. I'm not embarrassed of it. Yeah, there always be a fake and a phony. But it's time that the church understands that if we're not careful, we're going to lose our distinctives of what we and who we are. And it doesn't make any well. What does it really matter? Because let me let me explain it to you like this. Some of you may I don't want to lose you here tonight. According to the dictionary, the definition of distinctive is this having a quality or characteristic that makes a person or a thing different from others. Different in a way that is easy to notice. 
Here's what the word, the key word here is different. Do you know the reason why the church, the Pentecostal movement, grew so rapidly like wildfire? Now the obvious answer is because God the Holy Ghost was behind him in the drawing force and power of reaching the souls, yes. But let me tell you some folks. The reason why the church of, of God, uh, the Pentecostal movement grew so rapidly was simply because those people, they knew that they didn't, they didn't have to be like, they didn't want to be like anybody else. They were God's chosen. They didn't care if they got made fun of. They didn't care if they got mocked. They rolled in the floor all night long. Some of them speaking in tongues the next morning had to get them up and drag them out of the building. They didn't care what people talked about them that was written in newspapers. They took pictures of folks. They burned their tents down. They threw them in jail. They did all kind of stuff. And the more they tried, the more the Pentecostal church grew. Why? Because they did not care if they were different. That's the reason why some of you remember many years ago, groups like the McCamey sang songs like, I'll dare to be different in a world of compromise. We don't sing songs much like that anymore because today the idea is let's, be, let's just all blend in together. I'm not talking about materialistic things either, folks. I'm talking about a distinct difference between the church and the world. You see, it's appealing to a lot of folks. But this is what I want you to see. This is the other definition here. It says appealing or interesting because... Of an unusual quality or characteristic. You see, unusual is not the typical quality or experience. Some of you that went through the membership that we went, we take people through when they join the church here at Gray Street, the Church of God. Now, you may remember this, but I showed you some videos from back. I showed folks videos from back in the 50s, the 60s, and 70s within the Church of God. I have literally had people that have gone through that membership program sat and watched those videos and cried. And you know what? I cannot, I honestly cannot tell you how many times I have been asked when those videos were over, what happened? I could show you videos tonight. I've got them saved on my computer of the Church of God meetings and you would ask, what happened? You see, there was something distinctive about the church of God, the Pentecostal movement. There was such an enthusiasm and an intensity in their worship. They didn't worship like anybody else. They didn't preach like anybody else. I've been made fun of for the way that I preach. Some folks say, well, you ain't got to preach like that. Maybe you don't, but I'm not nobody else. I am me. Well, all you got to do is get up and talk to people. Well, sometimes I might talk, but when I feel the Spirit of God, I can't get up and just talk. So you can say what you want to, but that church movement, the Pentecostal church, they sang, they worshiped, they preached with enthusiasm and with an intensity that set them them apart when you when you heard a Pentecostal preacher preach you knew he was Pentecostal when you heard a Pentecostal sister get up and go to singing almost every time you knew she is Pentecostal come on somebody but you see the lines have been so muddied now and some of our non-denominational and some of our other churches that don't even believe in the gifts of the Spirit, they wised up. They started realizing the Pentecostal movement was growing like crazy. You see, their singing, their worship, their music was off the chain. Can I say it like that? While some of them were still singing in stanzas and their music was dead as a dead can be. And so you know what has happened over the last 20 or 30 years? Some of the other churches that don't even believe in Pentecostal moves of God and the Spirit of God have begun to change their styles of music to mimic that of the Pentecostal church. And what is the Pentecostal church doing? I've watched the Pentecostal church get to the place where there's no enthusiasm, there's no zeal, and no intensity in their music. 
Every time that a man or woman of God that is baptized in the Holy Ghost that gets up to sing, they ought to be asking God, help me to be anointed to sing. I've joked around about it, folks. But do you know how embarrassing that it would be to some of them Pentecostal saints of years gone by to see some of our saints get up and go, I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. I never shall forget the day. All the burdens of my soul were rolled away. Made me happy. Folks, that may sound ridiculous, but I am not kidding when I tell you their intensity, there was an excitement and there was a zeal when they sang. That's the reason why it didn't take much because people felt what they were saying. When they got up to sing, folks, they were singing. Folks, they say, well, we can't sing out of the red back hymnals. I have heard, and I've got some videos where I've seen people sing them red back songs, stuff like the old gospel ship, and they weren't beating the drums, the drum heads off. They were, come on, they were singing like normal folks, and they would say, oh, I'm going to take a trip on the good old gospel ship. And the next thing you know, folks in that church felt the intensity, and that whole place would blow apart. Why? Because folks had had such an intensity in their music and in their worship and in their praise to God. And I'll tell you, if we lose that intensity in the church, there's nothing distinct. There's nothing different about the church than anybody else. Folks, if you've got used to just sitting on a pew, dead, amen. Amen. You know what David said? David said, the dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down to silence. You ever seen them little stickers they put on the fish tank years ago? I was fascinated with that. That was before they had PS4 and stuff, you know. But I was fascinated with this little sticker that my mama put on the outside of the fish tank. It was a thermometer. And it would change colors. And it would show you what the temperature was in the fish tank. Sometimes... I think to myself, there are some folks that they claim to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and they claim to be Pentecostal that if you stuck one of them stickers on their head, it wouldn't light up one bar. Dead. Dead. Huh? Now, I think it's kind of comical in one way, but I had a preacher friend of mine. He said, I have attended and I have conducted and officiated a lot of funerals in my time as a preacher of the gospel. He said, but you know one thing I found is common? I have never been to a service, a funeral, where the deceased sat up in the casket and looked around and said, I'm dead. As a pastor... I have never met one person that would willingly admit I'm dead. Folks, a great deal of the church is spiritually cold and dead and do not realize where they are but God, if you can muster up some zeal within the body of Jesus Christ, I believe that tonight that a lot of what people call the Pentecostal church is more like the army of dry bones that rose up on their feet. They had muscle, they had sinew, they had a name. They called themselves Pentecostal. But it was only until the man of God, under the inspiration of God, looked at that army and he said, Breathe, O oh breath, unto these that are slain. Do you know what the breath of the Holy Ghost will do to the church it'll put life back into the body of Christ folks when you get so eat up with the zeal of God and you're burning up to do the will of God it don't take a whole lot When's the last time that a tambourine shaker got to shaking that tambourine the Holy Ghost fell on them and they got to shout across the platform under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost? When's the last time that we had a drum player playing on the drums and shout right off the drums because the power of the Holy Ghost hit them? Let me tell you something. When the church gets back to the place that we get our intensity and zeal and excitement back, through the anointing and through the Spirit of God, you're going to see the church come alive. The reason why the church don't do any more than it does is because it's lost a lot of its distinctives and it's dead. That's why. 
You see, Jesus Christ is life and life everlasting, life evermore. So if the church is dead, how can we say that we have his spirit living and abiding? It's dead, dead is all I... Listen, I want you to think about something for a minute. You may claim to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost lives in you. Now that's a pretty bold statement. But whenever you are embraced or you are challenged or confronted with an opportunity to do something for God... You always shy away from it. I hope I haven't preached you to death. I've just about preached myself to death tonight. But I'm going to tell you. I've shared this in the past. But in my younger days, I was a lot more bolder. Or I don't know what you want to call it. I said some things sometimes without as much wisdom and tact. Sometimes I still wish I could do that. But I just. But I was preaching in this church. Pastor invited me, Brother Sanger invited me to preach here. And I was young and pretty bold to save this by anything I felt like God wanted me to say. And I was in here one night and I was preaching about the baptism of the Holy Ghost right here in this church, eight years before I ever came here to pastor. And Sister Jackson's granddaughter was married to my wife's brother at the time. And she had given her heart to the Lord. She just got water baptized. And my wife and I came to support her. We were telling her, we're going to pray for you to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I preached that night on the baptism. She was the first person in the altar. This altar, this thing looked a little different. I got pictures of it before. But she was praying right about here. I can still remember in my mind, right about here is where she was praying at. My wife came down. We were both praying. And that night, the church wasn't packed But there was a pretty good crowd here. I would say there was at least 50, 60 people here that night on a midweek service. And guess who was in the altar? Jennifer was kneeling the altar. I think there might have been one or two other people on the other side of the church. Here we are praying, God, give her the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Me, this is not even my church. I wasn't a pastor. I was just a visiting preacher. We're praying our guts out, so to speak, trying to pray, God, give her the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, while I'm praying for it, it dawns on me. Where is everybody? I looked out across the platform. I looked out at the church and everybody's just sitting there like a bunch of toad frogs sitting on lily pads. And if they didn't blink, you wouldn't even know if they was dead. Now, folks, I know that I'm, I know that's being strong, but folks, anyway, you know what I said? I got so aggravated. I looked out at the church I said, how many of y'all are baptized with the Holy Ghost? Hands with everywhere. I said, she's down here praying for the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you have the Holy Ghost. What are you still sitting in the pew for? All of a sudden, about six or seven people got up and flocked to the altar. They said, oh, Brother Myers, you should. I probably shouldn't. I was a little bold. But I can tell you one thing. The whole premise of what I was saying is, is that a lot of the church today claims to be Pentecostal, but they don't represent what the Pentecost of the Bible was. There ain't no life in them. There ain't no fire in them. There ain't no get up and go in them. Let me tell you, say, well, I'm old. Well, you know what? I've seen some folks before they get electrocuted at 60 years old, and they'll jump right up out of their seat. I had a preacher tell me one time, I gotta, I gotta close, because now I'm getting crazy, but Brother Rufus Carraway, he was telling a story one time in camp tent meeting. And man, I like to almost laugh my eyeballs out. He said some folks, they, they fake like fake stuff. You know, oh, I can't do nothing. And I can't do it. He said one day, he said he was driving down the road and his lady had gotten into a car wreck and her car went off in the ditch. He said it really wasn't nothing that big. This car kind of drifted off the side of the road and landed in a ditch. It wasn't really that bad of a little thing, just a little dent in the fender. And you, if you'd have seen him tell it, you'd probably cry laughing. But he said, I got out. I looked. I said, ma'am, are you okay? And he said, automatically, oh, my neck. And he said, I'm looking at the car. He said, look, there's barely any, any damage to the car. And she's acting like she was dying in the car. Oh, my neck. He said, I know what she was wanting, some insurance money. That's what she wanted. Oh, my neck. He said, all of a sudden, somebody said, 
I think I see a fire underneath the hood. She was in the middle of, oh, my neck. Somebody said, fire. He said, she shot out the side of that car door, broke out in a full run. He said, she was just getting it across there. He said, she forgot all about her neck. Let me tell you something, folks. He said, I'm too old to shout. I'm too old to obey God. Amen. Let go of your neck. Amen. There might be a fire up underneath there somewhere. You'll be surprised when the Holy Ghost gets on you what you just might do. How you know? I've seen old men run the backs of the pews. I've seen men of God stand up in the middle of a service, can't even barely talk, come in and take the whole service over, start preaching the word of God. I watched one night, I told you I gotta close. I watched one night in Panasofki, Florida. Brother S.J. Davis was preaching. A man and a woman came in, and I'm not, I don't wanna be funny here, the man and the woman looked like if they sneeze, they would just have to roll a coffin right up beside them and just lay them right over in it because they looked like they was about to die. Sister Myers, she's shaking her head, yes. I'm not being mean. Y'all don't know who they were. They were, they looked, I mean, the lady looked, she was so, she looked like bones. She was so frail. And she was blind and he was deaf, or vice versa. As a husband and wife, one was blind, the other was deaf. But they came to church. I think somebody said they were like 93, and the other was like 91 or something. So they came in. Folks had to help them to get into church. They got them to their seat. And the Spirit of God got to moving. The Holy Ghost fell. People were shouting and praising God. That lady, I think she couldn't see. One of the, I think it was she couldn't see. They got to praying with her. And all of a sudden, she was standing up. I was praying for somebody else. She was standing there. They got praying with her. She all of a sudden, the power of God hit her. She went straight backwards. And they had some old pews in that church with a wood piece on the front. Didn't have that padding thing on it. Solid wood on the front. She went backwards, and I heard it sound like somebody was in a baseball field. Man, it made a thump and a clack. Boom. I didn't know what it was. I was over here praying with somebody. All of a sudden, Sister Davis, uh, S.J. Davis' wife, her eyes were real big. She come over and got me, Brother Joe. Brother Joe, I'm like, what is it, Sister David? She said, come here. She took me by, took my hand, and she walked me over where that old lady was. She was laying on the floor, and her eyes were going. She took my hand and slid it on the back of that lady's head, and I am not exaggerating. I'll be literal. You ever felt a golf ball in your hand? It was literally like somebody took and sliced her scalp and slid a golf ball underneath and sewed it back up. It was a gigantic golf ball size knot on the back of her head. I'm like, I want to hyperventilate, but not in the spirit. I'm like, oh, Lord, this lady's going to die in the church. I've never seen anything like this. This is bad. So Sister Davis and all of us were like, pray, God, pray for her. So we were gathered around and we was praying like, we, boy, we was really praying. And you know what? When the service was over with, she was still batting her eyes. And they picked her up off the floor. She couldn't hardly walk. But they took her right on out of the church. They said her husband, the one that couldn't hear, he was over there shouting. Ninety whatever years old, barely couldn't even walk in the church. But when the Spirit of God fell, honey, they was getting it. They was shouting it down. Let me tell you why. Because ain't no grave going to hold this body down. <laughs> ain't nothing going to keep you back. Honey, when the Spirit gets in it, there ain't nothing that can stop you. Somebody say amen tonight. Hey, amen. But these are the things I've got to I've got to share these, and then I can close because I said I was going to so the plane is it's coming down to runway. Okay, so what is it that is different about the church, and what is it about the Pentecostal church that set it apart from other doctrines and creeds and beliefs? You ready? And the number one thing was its zeal and passion through prayer. You ever seen anybody Pentecostal pray? I'm talking about somebody baptizing the genuine power of the Holy Ghost. They get to praying. You ever been in a hospital room in a desperate situation and somebody grabs somebody's hand, Pentecostal baptizing the Holy Ghost and go to praying? 
I believe there's a difference. You can say what you want to. But in worship, I've been in a lot of worship service, but I've never been in worship service like that of Pentecostal folks that really know how to worship. You say, are they better than anybody else? Please don't leave here saying or thinking that. I'm just telling you that a lot of churches have lost these distinctives in their preaching. A lot of our preachers today, please turn with me to the book of John chapter number 1. They're so dignified that if a hair gets out of place, they're going to be in bad shape. Well, if that's the kind of preacher you wanted to hear, boy, you, you messed up bad, didn't you? But in their preaching, in their teaching, I remember whenever I got saved, I'm going to tell you all something. Sister Candace was talking about putting your bad shoes on. Oh, you ladies, you know what I'm talking about. And I'll tell you folks something. Sister uh, Rhonda, she was Sister Rhonda Davis at that time, but she was one of the baddest Sunday school teachers I ever heard. Sister Myers can tell you, if you ain't never heard, you've ever heard Sister Rhonda teach, she sounded like she was preaching. She would kick that leg and get to going. Am I right? Anybody ever heard Sister Rhonda pre- preach, teach? Hey Amen. You see, whenever you get it down inside of here, you can't help it. When folks walk in, do you know what drew me to the Pentecostal church? It wasn't their rules. If I, they'd have come up with me some rules, I'd have said, bye, see you later. But it wasn't that. You know what drew me to the Pentecostal church? It was the anointing and the power and the intensity. And that's what drew me. That's what's kept me all these years because I knew God was in it. But they have also, another one of the distinctives was the spiritual sensitivity and obedience. How many know, how many over the year, am I preaching too long tonight? If I am, just tell me, I'll close. That spiritual sensitivity to the spirit, when the spirit of God's moving, the people knew it. There was a time in the church whenever the Holy Ghost started giving out a message, everybody was quiet. Everybody stopped what they were doing. And they reverenced the Holy Ghost. And they trusted God. I've, I've had times before where I've been in service where the Holy Ghost was giving out a message, people were just talking. People that have been in church all their life, just a total disrespect. But you see, whenever, when you got folks that know what the Spirit is, they are sensitive to that when the Spirit of God moves. You know how many times over the years, some of the greatest moves of God that I've ever seen were those times where somebody like Sister Tracy came in, had a bad week going through some crazy stuff, about to lose her lunch, you know, bad. And then all of a sudden, somebody from the other side of the church gets a burden and the Lord speaks to them and says, go over there and pray with her. I have, I have been in some of the most powerful services that really weren't, that didn't have much direction and all of a sudden one brother or one sister obeyed God. You see, a real true Pentecostal church is a church that is sensitive and obedient. It's not a church that's got the kind of, listen, I believe in borders, boundaries, and I believe in control and all that. But I don't tell you when the Spirit of God's in it, He is in control. I don't care if I'm in the middle of preaching and you feel like getting up, walking across the church and laying hands on somebody. If it's, if God's in it, then go for it, honey. Because we as a church better get back to being sensitive to the Spirit. Brother Ralph, if you ever feel the Holy Ghost come up on you and you want to just jump up and shout, go right. It's all right. Go right ahead. It ain't going to bother me a bit. We need to get back to the day that we're sensitive and open obedient to the Holy Ghost. Amen. The number four thing that I've seen people have lost a lot is their intensity of worship. Our worship has gone to praise God. Really getting into it. Amen. Praise God. Yes. Hallelujah. How many times have you singers ever been up singing and you thought to yourself, man, I must be really dead or I must be really boring. I must be, something must be wrong. I better go back to practice because I nobody wants to even hear me. I'll tell you how many times on the way home from church when my daughter was living at home and I'd have to encourage her on the way home, she'd be crying. What's the matter? So nobody wants to hear me sing, and I just think I'll just quit singing. I, what do you, what, what? So when I was singing today, so everybody was just looking around. They weren't even listening to me. And I was really pouring out my heart. I was really trying to give it everything I had, and nobody was listening to me. And it just, I just don't, Dad, I don't want to sing anymore. You know something, folks? Whenever you get to the place that your worship is intense, it totally changes the atmosphere. Is anybody besides me ever been in? You know the difference between a regular church service and a camp meeting service? Because people come with a different attitude and it creates a different atmosphere. 
God ain't no different than a camp meeting than he is in a regular church service. Tell me, am I right? Sister Amanda, you have some camp meetings over there at the church that you go to. You ever wonder to yourself, how come the same people that hoop and holler whenever the visiting preachers came and the same church service on midweek service and they sit on your pastor? But they get up with somebody who may not be able to preach as good as your pastor. Whoa! Hallelujah! And you think to yourself, what was wrong with last week? And I'll tell you, the intensity of our worship's got to change. Somebody say amen. The other thing is, the role of importance of sanctification in the church has completely changed. Now we've got to the place we've watered it down that it doesn't matter. Pure, holy living, righteous living doesn't matter. We've got in the church today people that call themselves Pentecostal that are shacking up and fornication and still teaching classes doing other things that they know are not right according to the word of God, but they keep justifying it by saying, well, I, well so-and-so does this. The true Pentecostal church. Now, Brother Myers, are you sure? Well, I hate that I had to do this for you, but here you go, since you wanted to know. He said right there in, in verse number 15, he said that uh, salvation and sanctification through the Spirit. I, you t- I know what you're thinking. You're about to preach us to death. Number six, distinctive, is the importance of being baptized in the Holy Ghost. Have you noticed there's not as much emphasis on being baptized in the Holy Ghost in a lot of our churches? You may hear people mention it, but actually seeing people go to the altar and pray like they used to pray for the baptism. Am I preaching? Am I telling the truth? Where people would actually go to the altar and you'd have ten, six, seven, eight, ten people gathered around and praying, God, give them the Holy Ghost. Do we see that anymore? Because what's happening in a lot of our churches is people have lost the importance of why we need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. We have lost in a lot of our Pentecostal churches the passion for evangelism. Everything I'm telling you, you can go back, study history, study the New Testament. And every bit of these things here were distinctives of the early church, that Pentecostal body. Whether they called themselves Pentecostal or not, that's beside the point. I don't even think they did. I just think that we associate an experience with that church. And that's why why we call it Pentecostal because what took place on the day of Pentecost but in all reality it should just be the church say amen somebody but then the other thing that I see is a hunger for more how many of our people today are sitting on the edge of their pew like I just want to hear what you I want to hear what God's got to say I want to hear one more message I want to hear one more song where's the hunger gone because real Pentecostalism has a hunger. And they only got two things because I know you're dying. The boldness of the fulfill the Lord's will is one thing, the distinctive that you, have, you don't see much more. I, I just blows my mind. People that claim to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and are bashful and too shy to even sing. I mean, y'all, I'm sorry. I, you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You have what early prophets of the Bible did not have. You're baptized with the Holy Ghost, but you can't even, you can't even testify. I'm not trying to be hard, and I know that's strong, folks, but listen. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. This last one, the sensational radical methods. You don't see it very much in the Pentecostal movement anymore, but there used to be a time whenever folks were radical. And they were sensational. I'm going to tell you this last story while you stand. I had a preacher friend of mine who got desperate. And he told me, he said, Brother Myers, he said, our church, it seemed like we wasn't growing. And he said, I had been praying, God, help our church. God, do this. God, do that. And he said, I just wasn't seeing anything. He said, I got desperate. We're talking about somebody filled with the Holy Ghost, really loved God and all that kind of thing. He told me, he said he got up before the church and he said, folks, he said, I'm ready to do something radical. Well, they didn't know what was coming. That week, he put the pulpit up on top of the church and there's roads right there driving by the church. He put the pulpit on top of the church started preaching from the roof. I think somebody said it made it on the news. And some folks probably thought he was the craziest man in the world, but let me tell you something. He was doing more than some. Because some of us, all we do is the same old thing week after week after week. We roll in, we roll up, we do two or three songs, we do a little bit of preaching, do a little bit of praying, and we go to the house. Is anybody else besides me, and I don't mean this enough, I love the house of God, I love to see a move of God, but is anybody else besides me, you ever get to the point where, you know, steak is great, but steak every single service, anybody else besides me ever want to just change things up? 
I've, I've told Sister Myers, I said, you know, maybe we need to stop talking about it. Just do some radical things. Because the Pentecostal church of the early age, they were radical. They did crazy things. And that's the reason why the church grew. They didn't, it wasn't nothing for them to just stop them on the side of the road and have church on the side of the road start preaching on the side of the road. Everything you see, let me, let me share this because if, you, if I've never, you've never heard me preach this before, you need to hear it preached tonight. Go back, read the New Testament. Come back to me later and tell me if I'm wrong. But by my calculations, somewhere between 85 to 97, 98, I'm going to say, percent of the great acts that went on in the Bible took place outside the church. But look at history within the last hundred years of the church today. It is almost the very opposite. Nearly everything that ever happens, if it doesn't happen in these four walls, doesn't happen. I'm just here to tell you tonight, the truth is, we need to know there are certain things that set us apart as a child of God. And I'm not going to let the devil come in and allow me to become dead, be rocked to sleep. I'm going to wake up. I feel like God's already helped me to do that. And I'm going to be what God called me to be. I'm going to preach with everything I've got. When it's time to worship, I don't care if i got five or 55 or 555. I'm going to worship God with my heart. And if you're not doing that already, you need to repent. You need to ask God to help you because God said that they, that they love him with their, with their lips. He said, but their heart is far from him. And that's where a lot of folks are tonight. You can say you love God with your lips, but do you really with your heart? Do you really, really mean business when you come into the house of God? Sister Tracy, have you ever been up on a platform before? You don't have to say what service or anything. Have you ever been on the platform before and you really, really were wanting to touch God in that service? And when you pulled up in the parking lot, you were thinking, we're going to have church today. You got up in the pulpit up here and you were singing. You were really pouring your heart out. And you looked around and you thought, nobody else wants what I want. Have you ever felt that? I can guarantee you, you are, you are not the only one. I, too, have felt that way so many times. But you know what I made up in my mind, Sister Benefield? I am going to keep pushing and pushing until the day I die with the help of God. If nobody else wants it, Brother Eric, I, if I have to preach to five or six that will want it and listen to me, I am going to give it everything I've got. I don't want to change. I don't want to become something else. I don't want to, I don't want to kind of morph into some other modern version of Pentecostalism. I'm not saying that I'm going to try to be stuck in the 50s or something. I'm just telling you, I'm not going to become some watered-down version of what the Bible says with the help of God. I'm going to give you an opportunity. Man, why not you come and play the piano for me if you don't mind, sis? I want to give us an opportunity tonight to be able to talk to the Lord. I know I've preached for a long time, and I'm very sorry if I preach too long. I'm just, my heart's full. I know it's a midweek service. Some of you got things to do tomorrow, and so do I. But I can tell you this much. If the church here at Gray Street or any other church is going to change, it's going to have to start with people that actually get a hold of it and say, you know what, I want this. There have been times before the sister been filled that me and my wife have pastored in places where that nobody else really wanted it, and so we had church all by ourselves. When I pastored at Mayaka, bless the people there, Brother Steve and Sister Reba can tell you, Sister Tracy was there a while. There were times in Mayaka where we'd be having church all by ourselves, worshiping, praising God. My wife be shouting around in front of the church. We have praise God. We come to ourselves.